But I wonder, have you ever wondered what it would be like uh, to have a new life? Have you ever wondered what it would be like to, to leave the old life behind and to reinvent yourself, to start over as a new person? I, I, uh, there's a story that I read back in 1999 in the newspaper and I, and I cut it out and kept it because it sort of struck me, this story. And it's a story about um, something that happened. There was a train crash in, um, in uh, Paddington. Near Lo- in London, sorry, near Paddington Station, and it was a really bad, uh, really bad accident. Uh, a lot of people injured and killed in that. And then I read a story a couple of weeks later about it, and it said this. So I'll read it to you when I get my glasses. <laughs> it says, "Just about every everybody must have had this fantasy. You survive a horrendous accident. Everybody assumes you're dead." So, you slip away to the airport, hop aboard the next plane to some distant destination and start a new life. Evidently, a number of people lived out that scenario two weeks ago in the confusion and turmoil following the fiery collision of two crowded commuter trains outside London's Paddington Station. Some survivors of the accident walked away without a word to anyone and boarded international flights that day. People are looking for a new start, aren't they? And some people saw this as an opportunity to have a new start of life, a a fresh life, to walk away from everything. Everyone thinks you're dead. Just walk away, hop on a plane, go to the Caribbean or somewhere like that and start a new life. People are often looking for a fresh start, a a chance to chuck in their old life and to try again. Well, in today's reading, Peter tells his readers that they do have a new life. And they have a life now, a new life now, because they have joined in suffering with Christ because of their faith in Christ. A new life that comes through suffering. And you're probably asking, isn't there an easier way to get a new life? You know, like, do I have to go through suffering to get this new life that God uh, has for me? But we know in 1 Peter, uh, P- Peter's been reading to, uh, writing to his readers and he's been focusing them in on what it means to, to live with opposition as, as a Christian and how you react to that opposition. In chapter 3, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw, he said, you've got to love your enemies, you've got to be, uh, don't, don't be afraid of them, uh, you've got to share your hope with others around you. Uh, in verse 13 and 14 of chapter 3, he said, who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, You are blessed. And in verse 17, he said, it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And in chapter 2, he'd said Jesus didn't retaliate when he suffered, but he entrusted himself to God who judges justly. Do you believe that? Like, do you really believe it? Do you really believe that suffering can be good? That suffering can have a purpose? That suffering can bring God's blessing? Do you really believe that? Because we live in a world that says you've got to do everything you can to escape suffering. Avoid suffering at any cost. I went to, um, I went to Macca's uh, the other day in Inverell, and, uh, and the people who were serving at Macca's in Inverell all, have, all wore the same T-shirt, a black T-shirt, and in white writing it said, Don't suffer. Order your coffee on the new mobile app. <laughs> we want to avoid suffering at any cost. And it's, uh, sorry, I should have showed you a picture there. Pre order your coffee on the new app. Um, but it's the same with the, the euthanasia debate, isn't it? What's the key to the euthanasia debate? It says that, uh, that suffering is a good reason to end your life. You can't have any dignity while you're suffering. Suffering and dignity are incompatible. So euthanasia should be allowed. We live in a world that wants to avoid suffering at any cost. Uh, Buddhism's uh, become uh, grown in popularity in Western nations. It's an Eastern religion, but grown in, in popularity in the West. And Buddhism says that if you meditate long enough, then the suffering, you'll see that suffering is just an illusion. It's not real. As long as you can meditate and put everything out of your mind, you'll find that suffering disappears. 
because we live in a world that wants to avoid suffering at any cost. And we know that people uh, often think that suffering is a good reason to believe that God doesn't exist. Now the argument goes, an all-powerful God would end suffering, but suffering exists in our world, therefore there is no real, good, powerful God. And sometimes I've seen people give up their faith in God uh, because of suffering. But I've got a sneaking suspicion that more people have actually come to faith in God uh, because of suffering. But you might be thinking, why should I have to live with the prospect of suffering? How can, I, how can I enjoy life if God is telling me that suffering is inevitable? And if I do suffer, why should I bother continue to, be, to try to, to do good to others? Well, Peter's going to show us today that suffering for being a Christian can have a good outcome because it gives us, firstly, a new life, a new purpose in life, which leads to new practices and a new perspective on life. So let's have a look at some of those things. Firstly, in the first few verses of chapter 4, we see that sharing in the suffering of Christ will radically change your direction in life. See that in verse 1? He says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, Arm yourselves also with the same attitude because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. Now that's a really interesting phrase, isn't it? He who has suffered in his body is done with sin. He's saying Jesus suffered. He was crucified to do away with sin. Because of Jesus' suffering, we've been washed clean. Uh, we've been, uh, Jesus has wiped out our sins. But then he goes on to say in this life, if you experience suffering for being a Christian, if you experience rejection, or humiliation, or opposition, or even death, then it's a sign that you belong to Christ. You've repented, you've turned your back on your old life of sin, and you belong to Christ. And that in verse 2 goes on uh, to, to highlight that again. He says, as a result, he does not live the rest of his lo earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. You see, the new life is not lived like the old life was lived. The old life was just whatever we wanted to do, that's what we did. But the new life is not lived for our own evil desires. It's lived for God's will. I'm done with sin and turn my back on it and leave it behind and go God's way. And we've all got things, and you can probably think of things right now. We've all got things in our life that we need to leave behind. We've all got things in our past that we want to get rid of and leave behind. And going on this list that's in uh, verse 3, uh, Peter's readers were no exceptions. They certainly had a lot of things to leave behind. Have a look at there in verse 3. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. These Christians have changed direction completely. You see the lives that they used to live? There'd be some interesting testimonies in that church, wouldn't there? They've left behind the lives of debauchery, lust, drunkenness, uh, orgies, all sorts of things that, you know, sort of the imagination goes wild, doesn't it? But they've left those things behind. And now he says you're completely different to your neighbours around you. Look in verse 4. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. They think you're strange because you're set apart for Christ now. You've left that old way of life behind. You've, you've stopped doing all those things that you used to do and now they think you're weird and so they're going to abuse you for it. But he goes on to say in, in verse 6, remember God's the judge. Remember God will judge us uh, and, and if people respond to the gospel of Christ, they will either keep their old ways or they'll leave their old ways. Because God wants us to live a new life a life that is fulfilling, a life with purpose, a new purpose in life to live for him. This is going to date some of you, I know, but uh, who's this family? The Partridge family, Louise knows, okay. This is my generation. When I was a kid, we grew up watching the Partridge family on TV. Uh, the uh, fella up the top left, oh, top left. 
David Cassidy. I don't know if you heard uh, during the week, but David Cassidy died at the age of 67. Um, David Cassidy uh, lived the life of a rock star. He became famous uh, through this show, but then went on to, uh, to become a rock star. In fact, he had a bigger uh, fan group than the Beatles had, more numbers of people in his fan group than the Beatles. Uh, he lived the life of a rock star, of fame, a life of fame and fortune, but he also went down the track of alcoholism. Uh, he had three marriages and three divorces. He had a number of other partners uh, in his life. And it's really interesting what he said on his deathbed, and these words were recorded by his daughter, who was at his side on his deathbed. His last words to his daughter were, so much wasted time. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, that uh, it really dis displays a tragic life, doesn't it? His life was wasted pursuing those desires, his own evil desires. And he realised it at the last minute. He had wasted his life. Well, Peter's saying, we've left behind this wasted life. You've left it behind and you're living a new life now. A new life with a new purpose. So what does this new life look like in practice? How do you make sure your life's not wasted? How do we live for the will of God? We're going to look at verses 7 to 11 because they help spell out this new life and what it looks like. Have a look at verse 7. The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gifts he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So he lists a whole, way, a whole list of ways that uh, this new life looks like, a list of things that describe this new life. And he says, first of all, in verse 7, you're living with the end in sight. So therefore, what have you got to do? What does it say there in verse 7? Be clear-minded, be sober. Why? So that you can pray. Pray clear-minded prayers. Pray, pray prayers that have a purpose, not just meaningless repeated chants or mantras over and over. Pray prayers that, that show that you've got a clear mind and you're praying for God's will to be done. I don't know if you know about the Hare Krishnas, uh, the Hare Krishnas in um, Sydney. When I used to go down to, the, um, uh, to Sydney as a young man, uh, when I was at uni, you used to see the Hare Krishnas walking around and, uh, and they had a mantra that they would repeat over and over again. And I read about it on the website and the website says the Hare Krishna mantra is a chant meant for enhancing consciousness to the greatest possible degree. Chanting the Hare Krishna mantra can give peace, happiness, God realization, freedom from repeated birth and death, and total self fulfillment. You know the words for the chant? Have a look, because this, you'll, you'll recognize these words if you're a fan of the Beatles. Uh, they go Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Hari, 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 Rama, Hari, Rama, 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 Hari, Hari. You say that over and over again and you'll achieve God realization. You'll achieve peace and happiness. You recognize those words though? John Lennon sang them, didn't he? Remember John Lennon's song, My Sweet Lord? And when it starts off, you think he's, he's talking about the Christian Lord. But by the end of the song, he's, he's uh, chanting. Uh, this Hare Krishna chant, and I think it's a reflection of John Lennon's life. Brought up as a young boy uh, in a Christian family, but ended up uh, being a Hare Krishna. But is that the sort of prayers that God wants us to pray? Over and over again, meaningless chants? No. P Peter says here in verse 7, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Pray for God's will to be done in your life and in our world. What is God's will? Verse 8 starts it for us. Above all, he says, love each other deeply 
because love covers over a multitude of sins. This is love that forgives. And as, love, uh, as you forgive others in love, it will unite us uh, in serving God together. In verse 9 he says, uh, offer hospitality to each other uh, without grumbling. Hospitality? What is that? Literally it means opening your homes to others, opening your homes to them. Interesting, we did a, we did a survey here um, in uh, last year, 2016. It was a survey that was done of the Australian child, church uh, uh, Australia-wide and, uh, and we took part in it and, it, and the results for our church uh, have come through this year. Some interesting results. And one of them was, uh, if you can read that, um, these are lists of people's gifts and skills. These are things that you said were your gifts. And the number one gift in our congregation, you can see that top line, is hospitality. You said that, you're, that uh, 45% of you said that you have the gift of hospitality. Is it happening? Is it happening? Or is it a gift that we've stopped practicing? Peter says you've got to open your homes to each other. Show hospitality. When it comes to gifts, um, in, verse, uh, in verse 10 he says, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. There's a challenge there to use your gifts to serve the church. There's a challenge for us today, isn't there? to use our gifts to serve the church. Are we using our gifts? Are you challenging yourself? Are you putting yourself out there to use your gifts to serve the church? You know, in a church this size, it's interesting that we can't even find enough Sunday school teachers to teach the, the number of kids that we've got. Are we really using our gifts the way God wants us to? Are we putting ourselves out there? In the uh, NCLS survey, 57% of attenders in this church agreed that their gifts, skills and talents are being used well at this local church. 57%. You know what that means? 43% of you don't feel that your gifts are being used well. Now there's two, uh, probably a couple of reasons that might be, uh, but one of them probably is that you feel that you haven't been asked to use your gifts. Uh, this verse doesn't say wait until someone asks you before you get up and use your gifts. See verse 10? It just says each one of you should use whatever gifts he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Are you putting yourself out there? 43% of you think that your gifts could be used better. What are you doing? As Nike says, just do it. Don't wait to be asked. Just get in and do it. And when, as you use your gifts, look at verse 11. He says, if anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. You see, you might, you might have gifts in, in, that involve speaking God's words, encouraging people, uh, sharing God's promises, sharing God's warnings and commands with others. That's good. Speak God's words to each other. And we should all be seeking to do that. But then there's also gifts involving serving. He says if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides. Now we're meeting people's physical and emotional needs, but don't wait. Don't wait for someone to ask you. Don't wait until you feel that you've got enough of a gift for you to use it. Don't wait until you think, well, I'm not quite up there yet and God's got to do a bit more work on me and he's got to give me a bit more strength so that I can use my gift in church. Don't wait, because God supplies, the, uh, God supplies what you need when you need it. God will give you the strength as you start using your gifts. Don't wait. Don't sit back and wait until you feel strong enough. Get stuck in and ask God to strengthen you. I've worked out while I was shaving this morning, I worked out a way to kill a few birds with one stone. I thought, here's what we could do. You should invite someone over to your house. Uh, you should uh, share some of God's commands and promises with them. Uh, you should, if they've done anything wrong, you should forgive them. And then uh, if, um, what's the last one? 
then you should pray with them to finish with. Okay, then now you've killed five of those things with one stone. You've shown hospitality. You've used your gifts. You've spoken God's words. You've prayed. You can do all those things in one hit. So I want to see people doing that. Kill five birds with one stone. No, no. I'll tell you later. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, invite someone over. What did I say? Uh, talk to them about what God's word says. Share some encouragements or promises or warnings, commands. Um, what was the next one? Forgive. Forgive them if they need forgiving, if they've done anything wrong. Pray with them at the end. And then you've shown hospitality. You've done all five things in one. Drinda's writing that down. So look out for Drinda. She's coming your way. Okay. But the aim of all this, what's the aim of doing all these things? Now look at verse, end of verse 11. The aim is that God may be praised through Jesus Christ. And in all things, God will have the glory. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. We don't do these things to draw attention to ourselves or to make ourselves feel um, more comfortable, you know, more important or anything like that. Peter was saying this yesterday as we were talking about leading service. He says, I don't, I don't feel that I should get up in front of people. You know, who am I to lead other people? It's not about you. It's not about you. It's about giving glory to God, using your gifts so that he can have the glory. Well, it's all right for God to get the glory and to get the honour. And you might think, well, it's all right for him because he's up there where it's nice and comfortable and I'm down here suffering for him. I'm being put through the ringer. Why should I continue to do good if God's going to allow me to suffer while I do it? Well, the new life we have also can, will change the way we think. Have a look at verses 12 to 14. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. This is going to change our perspective on life, the way we think. Because first of all, he says, don't think it's abnormal when you suffer. That's normal. It's going to be normal for Christians from now on. And don't, don't treat trials as abnormal. Rejoice in them. Can you rejoice in your trials and your opposition and your suffering? He says, when you participate in the sufferings of Christ, you share in his glory. Now, I've got to remember that Peter was writing uh, we saw this in Bible study through the week. Peter's writing to a culture which is called a shame honour culture. They believe that you, you do things that will bring honour to your family and to your name. And you don't do things that will bring shame on your family and on your name. That was a powerful motivator for their actions. You do what brings honour. You don't do what brings shame. But they also believe that suffering was a sign of shame. If you're suffering, that means you must have done something wrong for either the government or the gods to be punishing you like this. So suffering is a sign of shame. But what does Peter say? No, you rejoice in your sufferings. You rejoice because you're participating in the sufferings of Christ. You're sharing his glory. Look at verse 14. If you're insulted, he says, if you're insulted for, because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. You're not shamed. You're blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. In verse 15, he, he re, sort of repeats it. He says, if you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. If you're going to suffer, make sure it's not for any of those shameful actions. If you suffer for being Christian, there is no shame. Verse 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. See, if we suffer as a Christian, it's proof that we bear an honourable name and we can praise God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise him for our suffering. Honour him in sharing the suffering, and we, we get honoured in sharing the suffer, suffering of Christ. So it comes down to this question. How are you going to stand in times of opposition and trial? How are you going to stand against them? 
Are you going to obey the gospel of Jesus and live the new life that God has for you? Or are you going to turn your back on the gospel of Jesus and go back to the old life? Because it's through our reaction to suffering now that judgment will work itself out. Verse 17 says that very clearly. It says, for the, it's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. How are you going to react? And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. When you're faced with suffering and trials, are you going to love your enemy or seek revenge? Are you going to use the trials and opposition as an excuse to live for yourself? You know, it's all too hard. I can't handle it. Uh, all my friends are turning against me. I need my old life back. Or are you going to continue to serve others with the gifts that God has given you in the strength that God gives you? Are you going to give up and give in? Or are you going to get up and get going? Peter says there's only one way for those who bear the name of the Lord Jesus, who trust the Lord Jesus with their lives. There's only one way. Look at verse 19, the conclusion to it all. So then... Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Two truths in that verse. Two truths I want to point out. The first one is that it may be God's will that you face opposition for being a Christian. It may be God's will that you face opposition for being a Christian. That's the first truth. The second truth is that God is far more faithful to us than we will ever be to him. We can trust him. We can trust him as we go through trials and oppositions for being a Christian. We can trust him because we know he is the faithful creator. We can trust him and continue to do the good, the new life, live the new life that he's made for us to live. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you that you have called us to a new life, a life with new purpose, a life with new direction, a life uh, that has uh, new practices, a life with a new perspective, a life that can be lived to honour you. Father, we thank you you've called us to this life, but Lord, uh, sometimes it's hard to see uh, in the confusion of our everyday lives uh, what this life looks like. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be more and more clear each day that as Christians we will face suffering. It's, it's not to be abnormal. It's a normal part of our existence. We will face opposition. We will face, face trials. But, Lord, when we face those things, please help us not to turn back to the old life, but to continue on in the new life that you've given us, loving each other, showing hospitality, using our gifts, so that we can each other grow. Father, I pray that you'd give us the strength that we need to serve you so that we can continue to do good, trusting our faithful creator. And we pray this in your name. Amen.